Now, uh, to read my notes, my, speaking of which, just a quick side note, um, I have a number five read note 428.1. There really isn't 428.1, there's a 428, but I have a notation system that I've created in my book to facilitate the lectures. So the note is 428, but try and find the passage. It's probably the second or third to the last passage in note 428. Um, this is a very critical passage. Okay. Um, again, Walter Kaufman translation of Frederick Nietzsche's Will to Power. Listen to this passage, and I'll, I'll, I'll go slow. He says, It is a very remarkable moment. The sophists verge upon the first critique of morality. Right? So, the sophists actually verge upon the very first critique of morality. The first insight into morality. They juxtapose the multiplicity of geographical relativity what the hell does that mean? They, here, juxtapose the multiplicity of geographical relativity. That's that, right? The fact is, the flexibility of the sophist, culturally speaking, as the polis expands and, um, and recedes, right? As the population leaves, the sophist is in a precise position to make cultural sense of the distinctions between cultures. So that's basically all that means. Right? The first insight into morality, they juxtapose the multiplicity of geographical relativity of the moral value judgments, right? So it's not just, it's the beliefs, right? It's not just sort of leaving one nation and going to another as much as it is an understanding and recognition that that when you leave, you bring your cultural beliefs and practices with you, okay? And your moral judgments, obviously. Um, just as a quick aside, let me give you an example so that you you, you see the you see the significance. Um, you can imagine what the moral judgment might be of a person who left um, an Islamic community, came to the United States of America. Let's say it's a, a woman, and she's this is so freaking general, but it's easy to understand. She's wearing a hijab, so she's covered. The reason why she's covered isn't because she was suppressed and she's not free and she's covered because she's protecting her modesty. It's, a, it's an act of modesty. Uh, she comes to the United States and all of her female peers are condemning her action. They are judging her morally. Don't you see that you're in the States now? You're free. You don't have to be high behind that. This is the land of the free. You can be free. You know, why are you doing that? Take that off. And she refuses. And insofar as she refuses, she tells him, listen, I'm doing it because, let's say she's open. She says, no, I'm preserving my modesty. And she's like, listen, you're just in the United States. You don't have to do that. Right? There is a sense in which there is a cultural judgment, but it's a moral judgment. Right? It's a condemnation of the act. That's, I don't want to go into more example than that. That should be clear. Right? So, of the moral value judgment. They let it be known that every morality can be dialectically justified. That is critical. They... Let it be known that every morality, they, the sophist, let it be known that every morality can be dialectically justified. Right? In the United States, for the American woman, she is justified by our social norms to tell the women and to encourage the women, listen, look, you can take it off, for real. Like, you know, I'm not trying to get personal here, but if you want to take it off, you can take it off. This is the United States of America. Take it off. Some women will. Some women won't. But there is a justification for sort of the Native American woman or man to encourage the Islamic woman to, hey, look, you don't have to do that. There is also justification and you see this all the time, CNN reporters go over, MSN, Fox reporters go over to the Middle East, um, and as a woman, again, super general example, I want to make this clear, when you go over there, there is justification that, listen, I know in the States you're accustomed to walking around like that, but you need to put on this a job. You need to cover up your arms, make sure you don't touch a man on his skin. Hey, listen, in the States, I, you know, what are you talking about? I'm from the land of the free home of the brave. Well, you're not there now, <laughs> so you better get wrapped up. Right? There is a sense in which that is justified. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. They're both right. Neither is wrong. Right? To be the sophist, you have to recognize that point. That point that Nietzsche says there is absolutely critical. They, the sophists, let it be known that every morality can be dialectically justified. Exclamation point. 
I mean, there's an explanation point there, but he should. That is, they divine that all attempts to give reason for morality are necessarily sophistical. Any attempt to construct a logical justification for morality is itself an act of sophistry. To think that it's anything other than that, Kant, to think that it's anything other than that, Mills, is to fool yourself. There is no universal norm with respect to moral conduct. Are you serious? You know, that's starting to sound, that's starting to sound, uh, that's starting to sound a little nationalist socialist party. <laughs> Let's keep it funky, right? There's a, there's, a, there's a standard by which we assess the moral actions of all people in every culture throughout the globe. Are you serious? Come on. No, that's absolutely wrong, right? Nietzsche didn't have to be a sociologist to see the falsity in that act. The very attempt to try and justify the act of morality is itself an act of sophistry. So if you're going to be a sophist, be a sophist, but at least know what it is that you're doing. Don't delude yourself to believe that you are representing, in some sense, the absolute truth. No. You are manipulating the circumstances in order to legitimize the conduct of the population. Period. I know what it is that I do when I do what I do. Listen, um, there's, there's a sense in which people need to be controlled. There is an institution that needs to control these people. I am part of an institution that controls people. It is called academia. If you want to get your PhD, you will conduct yourself accordingly. If you don't conduct yourself accordingly, you will not get your PhD. Period. There's no exceptions. That's just, it's the system. I don't delude myself to think that this is the absolute truth, right? This is exactly why I'm giving you this lecture for free right now, because I know it's, I know it's crap. <laughs> Come on, man. You know, my classes are $1,000 a credit hour. <laughs> That's a lot of money, right? This lecture that you're getting is absolutely free. Right? I am, this is the greatest representation of software street ever because when I turn off the camera in the university where I am filming all these hours and hundreds of hours of lectures, my students have to pay to listen and based on their performance, I'll assess whether or not they deserve to go on to the next stage. And I play that role and when I put on that hat, I put on that hat. I don't wear that hat when I talk to you. First of all, it's not even you. I'm talking about HD flip. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's just me talking to myself, right? When I put on this hat, I'm, I, I play both parts, and I don't have a problem doing both roles. I have no problem getting money from higher education to perform the services that I perform because I do a damn good job. I also don't have a problem giving you hundreds of hours of lecture for absolutely free and not asking for a dime. There's no contradiction at all. Right? The sophist is in precisely the best situation because the sophist recognizes the flexibility of the system. It takes a certain breed of person to be able to manipulate the system in that sense. It takes a certain breed of person to be able to be part of the pay-to-play educational system and also offer something which could, in theory, pose a very great threat to the system. Like, if this caught on, Right? If, 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 if more academics started doing this and there was just infinite amounts of information out there and there was some way to acknowledge your understanding of all of this information that we're putting out for free, well, you know, this could present a real threat to the system. Right? The idea is it really doesn't. It really doesn't. This is no threat. Right? Why? Because they've employed a sophist. <laughs> they know who I am at my heart. <laughs> oh, I'm going to play ball. <laughs> I'm going to put on that shiny suit and the shiny shoes and the shiny smile, and I'm going to play ball, and I'm going to do it like a good immoralist should do it, without any moral consideration at all. Because I'm not going to be governed by morality. Right? I don't have the moral complications that the other people have, because I'm a bona fide immoralist and I'm a sophist, and I'm a Dionysian. So when you combine all of that, <laughs> you're, gonna have, you're gonna have an oppositional force that you're just not ready to, you're not, you're not in a position to battle unless you're like me. Because you're gonna be grounded to something. 
you're, you're, you're still searching for an answer.